Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, season finale for Mechanics and Materials, Fall 2020. Okay, maybe that was hyping it a little bit. It's not really a season finale. It's kind of anticlimactic, actually. Uh, but uh, tonight is our last lecture. <clears throat> so, uh, as usual, before we get into tonight's topic, is there anybody who has any questions they would like to ask of me before we dive into tonight's topic? All righty, so uh, hopefully you all can see the screen to the little, there we go. Okay, so our last topic for the semester is column buckling. And column buckling is a phenomena that happens generally when you have a uh, structural member that is carrying compressive load and a long slender member carrying compressive load is known as a slender column. Slender columns are prone to buckling uh, at long before the column material itself yields or fails, thereby greatly reducing its compressive capacity. So what we're basically saying is that if you had like uh, a steel column, and if you loaded that column and it was fairly short, then eventually you would get to the point where the steel, the material itself will start to yield and or fail. And so uh, short braced columns fail by the material failing. But if the column is long enough or slender enough, then it might buckle before it gets to the point of yielding which could be very dangerous because you could have something that fails in buckling long before its calculated capacity if you have not uh, take this uh, buckling into consideration. Okay, so that's the issue that we're talking about tonight. <clears throat> Where you could have a column that is loaded with some P critical load. And if the load applied is greater than this critical load, then the column will start to buckle. And once it starts buckling, uh, it may or may not be able to carry any more load after that point. It may develop a uh, instability. And uh, at the point of buckling, it may just collapse. For each column, there is one unique value of P critical. That is the column, that is the load that will initiate the buckling on that column. Any load in addition to P critical causes a rapid instability. Okay, so a column's resistance to buckling is actually related to its bending resistance about its weakest axis. To solve for the critical buckling load P critical, we start with the double integral for displacement that we talked about in lecture 25. So remember, lecture, there was only a couple of lectures ago where our equation is EI and D squared V DX squared. Uh, remember uh, D squared V is the derivative of the slope. DV dx is a slope and V is the deflection. So it is the derivative of the slope is equal to the moment as a function of X. So if I apply that to this situation, if I count V is the out of plane deflection. So when this thing bows, that's my V, my deflection. And if I take a slice right down the middle, and uh, look at a free body diagram. I have my internal moment and my internal force P at a distance of X from the end. And P is at an eccentricity to P. They're offset here 
by the magnitude of the displacement. So the more that this thing bows out, the more uh, unstable it is because you have more eccentricity on that axial load causing more bending stress. So when the column starts to buckle, the column will deflect by a value of V from this equation here. And so EI D squared V DX squared equals M sub X. M sub X is equal to minus P times V. Uh, so remember when we talked about combined loading and the applied moment was equal to the axial load, the force pushing down on it times the eccentricity. This is the same thing. The moment is equal to the axial load times the eccentricity, which is the magnitude of the deflection. Everybody okay so far? Any questions? Okay, so if I move uh, the PV off to one side and solve for zero, uh, M sub X is equal to P sub V. So then I can take uh, P sub V over EI, bring it over to this side and solve the differential equation. So now everything in here is in terms of V and the solution to this differential equation is this expression here, n squared pi squared ei over l squared. So p, what we're looking for is that critical load that causes this thing to buckle and to become unstable. That's the p that we're solving for. Where in this equation here, n is equal to the number of sine curves I should have an E right there, but number of sine curves, which I'll explain that in a second. And P critical occurs with the minimum number of curves. So the minimum number of sine curves is the misspelling here, but is the uh, shape that creates the minimum critical buckling load. Okay, so if we say that uh, n equals one curves, the, the most fundamental shape, then we can define the Euler buckling load, P critical is pi squared EI over L squared. And this is known as the Euler buckling load. And there is Mr. Euler, Leonhard Euler, 1707 to 1783. He was Swiss. He was a mathematician, a physicist, astronomer, geographer, log logician, and an engineer. Considered one of the greatest mathematicians of all time and the most prolific. His life work fills 92 volumes. Uh, this guy made so many contributions to so many fields of engineering. It's just unbelievable. So that's why they call it the Euler buckling load because Mr. Euler himself solved that differential equation and understood this to be the critical load causing buckling. So in this equation, E is Young's modulus of elasticity. I is the moment of inertia about the weaker axis uh, because if you put an axial, pure axial load on a member, it will find the path of least resistance and it will buckle about the weakest axis. L is the unsupported length of the column. And if we introduce a new section property, we're gonna call it little r, and little r is known as the radius of gyration. Little r is defined as the square root of the moment of inertia divided by the area. And when we do this, this is a handy little index. So therefore, if I solve this for i, i is equal to the area of the section times r squared. And I can bring that here, substituting for i, so P critical is equal to pi squared E AR squared over L squared. 
And this is the axial load. If I divide both sides by A, then the load divided by A is the normal stress. So P over A is going to be in the normal stress of the critical stress. A on this side uh, is washed out. And what we're left with is pi squared E over this L over R squared. And so as I said, P over A is sigma. So sigma critical is pi squared E over L over R squared. L over R is what's known as a slenderness ratio. So it, it doesn't matter if the column is two feet long or 200 feet long. The length doesn't uh, matter without consideration of the section. You could have a huge section property and the column could be 200 feet tall, no problem. You could have a really, really thin section property and it'll buckle at less than two feet. See, so it's the length divided by the section property, this radius of, right, of gyration that really matters. For example, um, well, I'm going to show you some examples of calculating this out. But uh, if you all remember when you used to drive to Cal Poly, and you used to drive to Cal Poly on the freeway, many of you would take the 10 freeway and would either come or go under the interchange between the 10 freeway, the 57, and the 71. And if you ever notice this, the 57 freeway is like way, way up there above the 10 freeway. And those columns are really, really long. Uh, I don't know how long they are, but they got to be at least 150 feet long, carrying all that freeway with all the truck loading up there. But those columns that are supporting that section of the freeway are like eight feet in diameter. So it's the length over section property that matters, not the absolute. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, anybody have any questions so far? Okay, as the slenderness, slenderness ratio increases, the critical buckling, another misspelling, the critical buckling stress will decrease. So the greater the ratio of L to R, then the lower the, the sigma stress is. So it takes the more slender, the longer the column is, the less stress it's going to take to get that thing to buckle. So here's a graph. I pretty much plagiarized this, stole it right out of the steel manual. And what this graph is showing you is uh, the vertical axis is stress, normal stress due to an axial load. And the horizontal axis is L over R ratio. And at an L over R ratio of about 50, the column is not very prone to buckling. In fact, the stress that it would take to buckle the column is actually higher than its yielding stress. So this column won't buckle. You just keep loading it and loading it, and eventually it'll just yield on you, but it won't buckle. But at a slenderness ratio of, say, maybe 100, you can see that the stress it takes to buckle this column at a slenderness ratio of 100 is, oh, I don't know, I'm eyeballing maybe 55, 60% of the yield. And as you get out to 150, 200, the stress that it would take to buckle the column is actually quite low. It does not take very much load at all to buckle a column that would otherwise have six times as much strength if you tried to yield it. So this becomes a very important parameter in column design. Uh, and this applies to wood, this applies to concrete, it applies equally to steel. All materials are prone to buckling. Okay, are we ready for an example? And the example I'm gonna start you with is a column that is 36 feet long. It is pinned at the top and bottom. 
It is a wide flange section. So you can see the orientation. I drew the flanges in there. You might not be able to see them in this presentation, but these are actually two very closely spaced lines that are representing the flange and the flange. So in this orientation, this column is not going to buckle in the major axis, but it might buckle up in the minor axis. The steel is a real steel shape. It's a W12 by 58. And the section properties are the area is 17 inches squared of steel. The major axis, IX, is 475 inches to the fourth while the minor axis is only 107 inches to the fourth. So you can see that uh, bending about this axis has about a quarter of the stiffness as bending about the major axis. The yield on this material is 50 KSI, standard for structural steel. Euler's buckling load is pi squared EI over L squared. So I can plug in my numbers pi squared. Uh, this is steel, so E is 29,000 KSI. I is going to be your minor axis. It's going to be the least axis that this thing can bend across, and the minor axis is what comes in here. The length is 36 feet. I convert it from feet to inches and squared, giving me a critical buckling load of 164.1 kips. The buckling stress is the buckling load divided by the area, and that gives me 9.65 KSI, which is significant because it is much less than the yielding stress of 50 KSI. See how dangerous this could be if you're not aware of this. You could look this thing up in a, uh, a steel manual or something, and 50 KSI is the yielding stress. If I went 50 times 17, That gives you a load of 850 kips. This column should be able to carry 850 kips, but because of its slenderness, it's going to buckle long before that at 164 kips. With pin supports and no intermediate support, this column will buckle long before it yields. Any questions on example one? Does that mean when, if you want to avoid the buckling, you should make the steel more thicker? You could. So you have, and thank you for that question. In the Euler's buckling load, you have several variables here. You have E, you have I, you have L squared, right? So you could change any one of those three. If you made the steel thicker, which is to say that you're going to pick a shape that is heavier than your minor axis moment of inertia of 107, that would go up. So that would raise your buckling load. You could also raise Young's modulus, but that's not very practical because in order to do that, you have to abandon steel and find something that is stiffer than steel. And that's just not a practical solution. I mean, nobody's going to dump steel for titanium when all you need to do is really just make the steel section thicker. But the most uh, effective way to raise the buckling load, the absolute most effective way is to reduce the unbraced length. So in many cases, you're able to do so by putting some support in here halfway up. And if you put in a support that just braces the column from bending out in this direction at say 18. So if you plug in 18 here instead of 36, I can do that real quick. Pi squared times 29,000 times 107 divided by 18 times 12 squared. The critical buckling load went from 164 to, if I brace it in the middle, so my unbraced length is only 18 feet instead of 36 feet, 
the critical buckling load went from 164 to 656. Mm, right. So you can see that is by far the most effective way. Uh, 656 divided by 164, that's four times, exactly four times. Well, that makes sense because I took that the length by half squared. So that's exactly four times. So you would have to make this section four times heavier to get the same effect as bracing it in the middle. See how that works? Yeah. Any other questions before I move on to example two? Um, why didn't we use the, the L over R squared formula? Good question. Um, I kind of did, but not directly. Uh, the reason that I didn't is I didn't have R calculated here. So let's go back. That's actually a really good question. All right here. Okay. So see right here? Uh, no, right here. Euler buckling load. This applies. So there's nothing wrong with this equation. This equation works. But I could take I out of the equation and solve for the stress directly by using this equation. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good answer because I was already given. Um, but both of these equations here and here are equally valid. Uh, they're, they're, they're equivalent. So if you already had I and you're looking for the buckling load, use this equation. But if you have R, which by the way, if you look up the steel beam in the steel manual, they'll give you I and R, they're right next to each other. So if your goal is to find the stress, then you can use this equation as opposed to what I did was I found the load here and then I divided by the area. It's one extra step, but either way, whatever you, know, you are comfortable with, they're equivalent. Okay, uh, are we ready for example number two? Uh, professor, quick question. Um, yeah. Is there ever a case where uh, a, like a column will buckle after it begins to yield? Oh, yes, that most definitely could happen. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, it, that's, um, First of all, that's, that is an advanced topic. I'd have to look to see if that's even covered in the book. That'd be interesting if it was one of those asterisk chapters, you know, that's like uh, optional. But yes, it could, because what would happen is if it starts to yield, then generally it's going to start yielding at some point on this column, it'll start yielding uh, at the path of least resistance. So maybe it starts yielding here. And what happens is when the column starts to yield, then the effective moment of inertia starts going down. So even if the, the column was stiff enough to support enough load to cause it to yield, once it does initiate yielding, we have this, we haven't even talked about this, but it's like an effective moment of inertia that starts dropping. And when this starts dropping, the load required to cause buckling will drop and that sucker will buckle. So yeah, it, it will yield and then buckle kind of simultaneously. Uh, thank you, I, I just thought about that. I thought it was kind of interesting as well. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. Um, I'll bet somebody's put some numbers to it and figured out the math on it, but it's not in the general course and it's really not taught in steel design either because the whole philosophy of steel design is once that puppy starts yielding, you're done. And they never look at post yielding. They don't look at what happens between yielding and catastrophic collapse. They're not interested in that region of the steel because you're already beyond what is acceptable for building design. 
So it's not really talked about a whole lot, but I, I think in reality, if you were to test one of these, that's exactly what you would see, yeah. Any other questions on example one? Okay. Example number two is a very similar beam column, but I wanna show you the effect of changing the section properties. So here I have the same unbraced length, but instead of a wide flange shape, I'm using a tube steel shape. So we're gonna go instead of the W12 by 58 wide flange, we're gonna go with a 12 by 12 by 3 8 tube steel. The area of the tube steel is only 16 inches squared, so slightly less metal than the wide flange, which was 17 inches squared. But look at the moments of inertia, the X and the Y, it's a symmetrical shape. So the X and the Y are equal to each other and they're both equal to 357 inches to the fourth. The yield on tube steel is a little bit less. Generally, it's uh, 42 instead of 50. And so if I go into Euler's buckling load and I plug in my uh, E for steel, 29,000, my least uh, moment of inertia, which is 357, 36 times 12 squared, I get 547.5 kips as opposed to 164 kips. Why the dramatic increase? Well, because the section is a lot more robust the moment of inertia is a lot larger on both sides than the wide flange was. The stress is 547 over 16 is 34.2 KSI. It's still less than the yielding stress, but it's a whole lot more than that wide flange was. So hollow shapes are more resistant to buckling than are wide flange shapes. So um, I assume that you have all been, at some point in your lives, you've all been in Building 17, the new engineering building on campus. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Yeah. OK. What? Really? OK, uh, no, no offense. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean any offense. Uh, I thought everybody had been in there. Oh, OK, all right. Well, I'll try to describe this. Oh, my goodness. I guess we've been COVID that long, haven't we? Wow, OK. Uh, sorry, guys, I, I didn't realize. Let me try to describe this. Uh, building 17 was uh, put up, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago. And uh, they knew when they were building this thing that it was going to be the new engineering building. Uh, building 9 is the old engineering building that went up in the 60s. Building 17 is the new one. And it's a steel building. The whole frame is steel. The floor is steel. It's got concrete on top of the, the steel floor, but basically a steel building. The lateral force resisting system for earthquakes and wind for this building are braced frames. And so well, I guess I could draw this, huh? Since, uh, I, since you guys haven't seen this, a braced frame. And what's really cool, the reason why I brought up building 17 is that they left part of that braced frame exposed uh, unfinished and undrywalled so that engineering students could walk by and go, oh, look at that, it's a brace frame. So a brace frame, here's a frame. And what we do for a braced frame is generally they'll have a steel plate welded up here, something like that, another one, something like that. And then they'll have another plate down here, we call these gusset plates. And I have another one down here and down here. 
And then you have uh, for a brace frame, uh, well, I can't do it that way. Oh, darn. Uh, let me do it this way. But as the name implies, a brace frame is braced. It has these braces that look like this and look like this. And it looks like that and that. And like that. Okay, so I was hoping you all had seen it because as you're walking down the hallway and you turn the corner right before you go out into the quad or the stair area, right where the uh, the bathrooms are off on the left right there. Well, as you turn that corner, this is exposed and you can see the brace frame. And what you'll see is that the beams are wide flanges because that's the most effective shape for resisting bending. The columns are heavier, but they're wide flanges as well, as they have bending and axial load on them. But the braces, the diagonals, are always tube steel. Why? Why are the braces always tube steel? And because they're long, See how long they are? They're crossing this diagonal. So they're actually longer than the columns. And when the seismic earthquake or wind or whatever hits, one of these is gonna be in tension. One of these is in compression. Nobody worries about the tension because that'll just go right up to the yield stress on the tension side. What you worry about is the buckling on the compression side. And just like Peter said, uh, the tube steel is the most effective use of the least amount of steel to resist that uh, compression without buckling. Uh, Mustafa, please explain what, okay, so the yield as, let me get my little spotlight back. The yield is 42 KSI. So if this material reaches a stress of 42 KSI, it will start yielding. And basically, it's effectively done. It, it, that's its capacity. When we calculate the critical buckling stress, sigma critical, we got to the 547.5 over 16 is equal to 34.2 KSI. 34 KSI is the most load this column can take before it starts to buckle. And I'm just illustrating that that load that causes it to buckle is still less than the yielding stress. That's what that means. Does that make sense? Oh, well, uh, so is is that mean like is it good or we have to change the design for the? It's neither good or bad. It's just um, it, it's neither good nor bad because we're not into steel design yet. We, we don't have uh, loading, so it, whatever compare. It, so it's buckling before the reaching the yield stress, right? Right. Okay. Thank but you. that doesn't necessarily mean I can't use it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I need to make it bigger or reduce the load. It's not illegal to have a buckling stress less than the yielding stress. We can do that as long as we design to this number, not this number. Oh, okay. I got it. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Because otherwise, if we, if we couldn't have that, then there's a lot of things we couldn't do with steel. Uh, yeah. So it's okay to have a, a, a load on it that would tend to cause it to buckle as long as we design with appropriate safety factors to be sure that it doesn't actually ever buckle. So what I'm saying is if, if I was in steel design class, then my capacity is the 34, not the, uh, the 34, not the 42. So maybe I'll design a column to take 20 KSI maximum which is less than 34 with a factor of safety, so that's okay. But in this class, without any regard to what 
you can design the steel too. I'm just simply pointing out that this column will never yield because it will buckle before it yields. Any other questions on example two? Okay. Okay, so Euler's formulation is based on a certain boundary condition. You know, like when, uh, when you do the double integral method, you get two constants of integration, right? And you have to use boundary conditions to solve for those constants. Well, in differential equations, kind of like that. And uh, what Euler did was he assumed that he, his column was pen pen. It was a pen support at the top, pen support at the bottom. And that gives you this nice uh, simplistic equation for the buckling. And here's what I was talking about with sine waves. The, Differential equation formulation is based on this shape. And you only get this shape if you have a pin at the bottom and a pin at the top. And between the two pins, you have one complete sine wave. So N is equal to one. If you had two sine waves, following my cursor here, if you had two sine waves, you would only get that if you braced it in the middle to keep it from moving. But two sine waves, you would have a much larger capacity than one sine wave, as I showed you before when I cut the clear span from 36 to 18 feet. But what happens if you have other support conditions? Well, we're going to introduce this K factor. This K factor is something that uh, we just invented. It's like an index to account for what happens if you have other support conditions than just the idealistic pen-pen condition. So like here, if I have a fixed, fixed condition, well, if the column is fixed, then it can have no slope where it's fixed. So you see the dotted line is perfectly up and down and perfectly up and down at the points of support. So the shape of this thing actually turns out that the equivalent sine wave from here to here is exactly half of the real distance. So K for a fixed fixed condition, K is equal to 0.5. Another way to say this is if the column is actually say 30 feet tall, it will behave as if it was pin pinned but only 15 feet tall. For a fixed fix, the sine wave is reduced to half of the overall length. For something that is pinned at one end and fixed at the other, it ends up being about 70%. So K is equal to 0.7 times L. And if I have a fixed column that is free to sway at the top, uh, this is what's known as a sway column when you get to your material designed concrete and steel. And so what happens is if you kind of push this thing over, or even if you put an axial load on it and it tends to buckle over, then it takes this shape. Uh, even though from the fixity down is imaginary, but this is the shape that it bends in. And you can see that this one complete sine wave is twice of the unbraced length. So in this case, K is greater than one. K is actually equal to two, which means that this column is much, much more prone to buckling than one that would be pin pinned. Is this making sense to you guys? Are you following this? Professor. Yes. The K value, you just multiply that by the length, and then that new length that you get is what you use in the equation now? Yes, it, yes, it is. I, I'll, I'll show you ex explicitly how it goes into the equation, but what you just said is, is dead on, yes. Okay, thanks. For a fixed free condition, the sine wave is doubled, making this condition very susceptible to buckling. 
Okay, so what uh, Peter was just saying is uh, instead of L in the Euler buckling load, what you use is KL, K times L. And this accounts for different support conditions with this modifier K. And then the critical stress is KL over R. And KL over R is what we call the effective slenderness ratio. This is a very, very important engineering function in your material designs, concrete and steel and timber. Okay. All right, I got a short little video. I'm gonna hit play on this. Uh, somebody please uh, tell me or chat very quickly if you can't hear this, you should be able to hear this. So please let me know if you cannot. Hello class, today we're talking about column buckling. So I have a little demonstration that I have for you to demonstrate column buckling. As you can see, I have a metal ruler that is fairly thin and very slender. This uh, ruler happens to be made of aluminum. So this makes a good demonstration of column buckling. If I apply a compressive load on here and I push down to, to a point, you can see that it starts to buckle. And this is the buckling shape. So the top and the bottom are considered to be pin supported. And when I put a load on it, it gets unstable and buckles out. If I was to push down much harder than this at this point, then I would basically fold up the ruler and have a very angry uh, coworker. So this is the shape and the behavior of a pin-pin column buckling. Okay, were you guys able to see and hear that? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. That was my visual aid for today and my somewhat cluttered garage. Okay, so let's go on to the next. Okay, so example three is that aluminum ruler. I measured it, I measured it quite carefully and that ruler is exactly one eighth inch thick, two inches wide and from top to bottom, it was 40 and a half inches long. So let's figure out what the uh, Euler critical buckling load is for that aluminum ruler. The moment of inertia about the minor axis is going to be two times one eighth inch to the third over 12, which is a very small number. 3.2552 e to the minus fourth inches to the fourth. Uh, the moment of inertia about the major axis is an eighth times two to the third but I don't even bother calculating that. There's no point to it. It's never going to buckle about the wide direction. It, it will always buckle about the thinnest direction. E, I assume, is 10,000 KSI. I looked that up for aluminum on the back cover of our book. So our Euler critical buckling load is pi squared EI over L squared. Uh, in this case, it was basically pin pin as you can see by the deflected shape in the video. So there's no need for a K factor in here. So I just have pi squared, 10,000, 3.2552 e to the minus fourth inches to the fourth over 40.5 inches squared. And that gives me 0 0.0196 kips or 19 and a half pounds, basically. So P critical, is basically 16 pounds uh, measured on a, well, I'm sorry, it calcs at 19.6. I put that same uh, ruler on a shipping scale and push down on it until it's just starting to buckle. It's not scientific at all, but I did get in the ballpark at about 16 pounds. So at least it's in the ballpark of 19.6 versus 16 pounds. And there's a lot of variables. And I, I never measured what Young's modulus is. I only assumed it. So this is very close and uh, collaborating in my mind. So that's how you calculate how much force it took me pushing down to get that ruler to buckle. Okay, now we have another visual aid. 
and where are you? There it is. Okay, here we go. Okay, and for our second demonstration, we're going to take the ruler and we're clamping it off so that the unbraced length is 35 inches instead of the original 40 and a half inches. And this clamping effects here basically is fixing the bottom from rotation. So now in this situation, if I buckle it, it takes quite a bit more force, but that's the buckled shape there, as you can see. Okay, so you, were you guys able to see the shape? That shape, I mean, I couldn't force it to get any closer to the diagram that I drew you, drew for you of a fixed free condition. Uh, that shape that I just bent this thing into looks just like that diagram. So you can see how the theory and reality really do uh, kind of come together here. Okay, so if I take that aluminum ruler and instead of 40.5 inches, the unbraced length is reduced to just 35 inches. Not a big change, really, only five and a half inches shorter. And I've changed it from pin pin to fixed pin. Now, what is the unbraced length? So here I go in, I got the same 10, I got the same moment of inertia. Here's that K factor. K factor for fixed pin is 0.7. So 0.7 times 35 squared gives you 0535 or 53 and a half pounds. And you can tell from the video, I had to honk down on that thing a lot more to get it to buckle on my uh, vice than I did pushing down on the floor. And that's 50 pounds versus 20 pounds. If the yield for the aluminum is about 37 KSI, then how short does that, how short would I need to clamp that aluminum ruler so that I can press down on it and it would fully yield before it buckles? You know, I, I reduced the length from 40 and a half inches to 35 inches by clamping it in the vise. Well, how short would I have to make it to get it to yield first? That's the question. So to answer that question, first of all, we need to know what is the load that it would take to cause it to yield. And that is the yielding stress times the area of the section, eighth inch by two inches. And that's about 9,250 pounds. Just to yield that skinny little ruler would take 9,000 pounds. So the maximum length to develop the full yield you need to back calculate, right? So I set P critical equal to 9.25 kips. I leave L as a variable. And when I solve for L, you have to rearrange and then take the square root. And L ends up being 2.66 inches. Isn't that interesting? If that ruler is any longer than just two and five eighths inch, it will buckle you have to reduce it down that short before it would take the full 9,250 pounds and actually yield before achieving a buckling state. Okay, any questions? Okay, well, that is my presentation on buckling for today. Uh, we still have a few minutes if you like. Uh, I'll entertain any questions that you have. Um, and when, and if and when everybody has had a chance to ask their questions, that'll be it for tonight. So who's got questions? Uh, I have one, Professor. Sure. So what's the difference of buckling and bending? Because it looks like the ruler is just bent, right? It, it's the same when it buckles. Okay, no, that's a that no, that's a very good question. Um, bending 
is applying an internal moment to the section. And that moment is causing the beam to bend. So it deflects in a bent shape due to an internal moment. That is different than buckling because bending is still stable. Um, you can bend a beam tremendously. You, you could take a, like a wood two by four and really bend it like a couple of feet before it ultimately fails and it's still stable. That's the difference. Buckling is caused by compression, not an internal moment, but by compression. And the compression starts the section moving outwards. It bows out one way or the other, just depending on the weakest direction. And once it starts bowing out, the internal moment is the axial load times that deflection. So the more it bends out, the more the axial load is called a P delta effect, the more the P delta effect is causing more deflection. And the more deflection is causing more P delta moment. So it's, an, it's a condition of instability. The more it deflects, the more it wants to bend. The more it wants to bend, the more it deflects. It will not catch itself. It will collapse because it, it is a it's a condition of instability as opposed to a condition of just applied moments. So it's like vibrating the, like, I don't know. I just imagine like how steel went to vibrate its ways. No, not exactly like that. Uh, Ernest, you had a quick question. I am about six foot one, or at least I used to be six foot one or I'm not quite sure why you asked that, but that, that's how tall I am. Um, okay, so back to the question at hand. It's a measure of stability. And the way that uh, it's been described in textbooks is you can have a, that's a terrible ball, but you can have a ball that's in a trough. And if you push that ball in one direction or another, it will tend to roll back to a point of stability. But if you have a condition like this and you put a ball and you push it, if it's perfectly, perfectly balanced, it will stay right at the apex of this curved surface. But just give it a little bit of a nudge in one direction or another, and it will start rolling off the side. And the more it rolls, the faster it rolls, right? Mm -hmm. So just a little bit of a nudge and this thing is gone. Well, this is an unstable condition. This is a stable condition. So a beam in bending is a stable condition. A column in compressive buckling is an instable condition. Ah, uh, okay, one more question. Um, where, how do you like do when the steel will curve left or right? Like in the ruler? Yeah. When you press it down, uh -huh. sometimes it goes, it bends to the left and sometimes it bends to the right. Yes. Is that totally random or? I, um, yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, before I answer that, I have, I have, well, uh, Leilani uh, asked, um, e each one of these videos that I've done, it goes to YouTube. And uh, I, I don't know what YouTube's policy is, but I've seen people have stuff up there for you know, 10, 15 years on YouTube. I have no intention of taking these videos down from YouTube. So uh, yes, these, these lectures will be available to you for a long time, as long as you remember my name and you know, can you can look it up with my name on YouTube. Um, I am I still haven't decided yet if the next semester if I'm going to record and put on the YouTube all the lectures again. I may not. I may just say, okay, everybody, lecture 26 is the same as lecture 26. You can go watch lecture 26. But at least there'll be your version, this semester's version of them on uh, YouTube. Okay. Um, 
why does it actually buckle to the left as opposed to the right? And it, it's kind of like, it's this question right here, right? It's, it's the old uh, riddle. If a rooster lays an egg on the very top of a barn, which way will the egg roll? Right? And the answer is? Roosters don't lay eggs. The yeah. answer is roosters don't lay eggs. Thank you. That's exactly right. <laughs> but if a hen laid an egg on the very top of a barn, which way would it roll? Well, now you're talking about, well, was that egg perfectly symmetrical? Was there a little bit of a breeze to the north? Was the wood slightly canted to the south? It's the same analogy with buckling of steel. Steel, first of all, when I push down on that ruler, although I tried as hard as I could to push down perfectly evenly without putting any kind of a, a bend in it with my hand, inevitably, either the surface condition at the bottom or the way I put the pressure with my hand at the top caused just a slight little bit of bending one way or the other to kind of get the whole ruler to get going one way or the other. But even with that, you noticed in one of those videos that when I pushed down on it, it bent one way and then it bent the other way. So I was doing a pretty good job of keeping it neutral and it just bent one way or the other. The final answer is the, the ruler, the material itself, even though it's all aluminum, every single molecule of that aluminum is not exactly the same. Uh, in all of our classes, uh, going through all the way through your design classes, one of the assumptions that you always have is that the material is homogeneous. So in other words, if it's a steel beam, the steel is exactly the same everywhere in that beam. Or if it's an aluminum ruler, the aluminum is exactly the same everywhere in that, in that ruler, but it's not, nothing is ever perfect. So even if the material had just a slightest little bit uh, more stiffness on one side and less stiffness on the other side, that would be enough to initiate uh, buckling on one side or the other. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, but in, in in Euler's formulation, it doesn't really matter which direction it goes. It's really just that it goes. And in uh, your design classes, again, there, nobody's going to try to predict if it goes south or north or up or down. It's just that once buckling is initiated, it is now unstable and will just further exacerbate itself until it either collapses or you get the load off. Okay. Uh, Mario, can you explain how the weak axis is determined? Um, you mean how I calculate the moment of inertia or how I know which direction is the weak axis? How do you know the direction of the weak axis? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me draw the ruler. Uh, let me draw. Oh, over here. There we go. Okay, so there's a cross section of the ruler, right? And you have a moment of inertia about this axis and you have a moment of inertia about that axis, right? So we learned this when we, when we learned how to calculate the moment of inertia. And remember my analogy to moment of inertia is like a figure skater. And when the figure skater puts their hands way out from their body, they spin rather slowly, but as they pull their arms in, into their body, then they spin much, much faster. So it's all about the material and how far from the center of gravity is the material distributed. So you can see about this axis, you have a lot of material that's a pretty far distance away to the left and to the right from this axis. But about this axis, all the material is really close to this axis. 
So that tells you that about this axis, the moment of inertia is gonna be very small, and that makes this the minor axis. About this axis, the moment of inertia is quite large, so this is the major axis. That makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Uh, oh, Peter had a question. Um, I have, I've taught quite a few uh, different courses for Cal Poly, um, but lately I've just been doing this course and I did a concrete design course in the summer. Um, to be totally honest with you guys, uh, going to the virtual learning, uh, that, that was a lot, a lot of work. I, I barely kept myself uh, ahead. Uh, especially that concrete course that I taught in the summer. And it took me two semesters to get this one uh, kind of under my belt, if you will. So um, having said all that, yeah, I've taught uh, steel design, concrete design. I've done senior project a few times. I've done structural theory. I've done statics. I've done mechanics. But I really kind of want to just stick with the mechanics and the concrete for now uh, I just don't have any more uh, margin in my life to create a whole nother course with this uh, PowerPoint virtual learning environment. Maybe when we get back on campus, that will change. Uh, but for now, I am very happily married and I'd like to stay that way, <laughs> if that answers your question. And, and yes, I am very happily married, so uh, I wouldn't do anything to jeopardize that. Uh, what is CE 3501, uh, Mustafa? I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. It's structural design one. Oh, structural analysis. Uh, I would be open to it. I, I've done uh, structural analysis or structural theory. Uh, gee, boy, it's probably about 10 or 12 years ago now, but I used to teach that for the construction management department, which is now in the civil engineering school. It used to be its own department. Uh, I would be open to that, but only after we get to go back to school and uh, kind of do it the more old fashioned way. Uh, just to add on to that, if you guys are looking for a a good uh, structural analysis professor. Um, Perez is a very good professor. I'd recommend him. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Good to hear that. I don't know if you guys know uh, uh, Dr. Perez. Excellent. I always like to hear that somebody's doing a good job. Anybody else have any questions for me? So um, I'm going to end this in a moment, uh, but just a reminder, uh, please watch the Blackboard for the announcement. I'm going to put a new announcement and a new invite for the Zoom class that is our final exam on Tuesday. It's not there now, and please don't try to get into it with the same invite you've been using all along for your lectures. Uh, this is going to be a new Zoom that I have to create just for the final exam. So please watch Blackboard and use that uh, invite for your final instead of uh, the one that you've had. Um, uh, thank you, Peter and everybody. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this too. Um, I just want to make sure I don't forget anything until we get right to that final. Um, Yes, use the new invite. It's not there yet, but I'll create it very soon. Use that to get in there. And then at the Zoom invite at like maybe five minutes, 10 minutes before five o'clock when the final actually starts, I'll well, give you more instruction no, on who takes which test and how to use the password to get to the right test. Uh, so make sure you, you tune into the Zoom um, again, I will not require a webcam. I will not require audio, but you still need to tune in to get your final instructions on how to get to the test. So uh, 
that's what I wanted to say. Uh, if anybody else has any last questions or comments, or we'll close this up for the semester. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liana. Leilani. Uh, okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you very much.